everyone. Um, we're going to start up again this morning and we're going to continue with the diagnostics uh, session. First we have uh, Jimmy and Ali giving a comment and um, then we'll have a discussion period and after that we'll move into the model waiting uh, session. So uh, Jim, can you hear us and can you share your screen? Okay, we can see your screen and full screen, but we can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? We can hear you a little soft though. Okay, I'll speak up. Yep, that's great. Turn my camera on. Yeah, your camera's yeah. on, we can see you. Okay, cool. Well, if we're, if we're ready to go, um, thanks everyone for interesting meeting. I tried to sit in as much as I could and um, really enjoyed all the presentations and especially really appreciated the invitation here because I actually went back and watched the video that um, Felipe highlighted yesterday and realized I was at that meeting <laughs> and I didn't remember very much. So it's like the axiom that if you have to talk about something, you, you, you have to know something about it. So it was it was fun to go back and, and speed listen to, to Henning and Andre and um, thanks Mark for, for putting that uh, meeting last year on. I learned a lot and thanks especially to Felipe. I don't have any, any real drama. Um, on, on his presentation, I think it was excellent. And all of these topics were um, worth looking at. And so I'm going to give a few brief comments on, on the set of these. And hopefully uh, we'll do a little um, advertising for, for some newer things that I don't think are too broadly understood or, or done that, that might be of use for, for tuna assessment diagnostics. And yeah, one of the, if you go back and watch the video that um, Felipe highlighted, you know, Henning is really fun to listen to at two times the speed, but um, he, he he gives some really good um, aspects, especially to the trade-offs of, you know, fixing something might reduce the, the value of, of some other aspects of your model. And, and that was certainly entertaining to listen to. Now, one thing that I haven't heard too much about is, uh, in, is data diagnostics. I, I put it at the top because I think that's something in the discussion or questions yesterday um, seems like an important thing and leads to all kinds of things about data weighting that I think is important. and lots of other aspects. Also, um, you know, in the context of data diagnostics, you know, are the, are there design imbalances for, for tuna assessments? You know, our CPUE indices change a lot. Um, for the case of Southern Bluefin tuna, you know, that there's some really significant uh, factors that need to be taken into consideration uh, to account for those design imbalances. Um, and just um, a bullet here on robustness. And by that, I'm talking about robust likelihoods that would come from data aspects. So I seem to be the only one that talks about robust likelihoods, but a lot of our diagnostics are potentially sensitive to, to some of those. And I'll, I'll um, bring those up perhaps in a, in a couple of slides here, just because, you know, doing things like jittering uh, are often set on autopilot. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll touch on jittering a bit. I'm not a huge fan because they're usually put on autopilot without looking at why uh, you're not getting a minimum or perhaps even the minimum may, might not be a real plausible result. And so I think there's some work could be done, or or maybe there's some solutions to uh, having to avoid jitter. Incidentally, since I'm talking about that aspect, um, one of the things in that 2002 pre-CAPM 
uh, diagnostics workshop that the Tuna Commission in San Diego held. They had an interesting way of looking at uh, model convergence. And I, I don't know if there, maybe the, we could save this question for discussion. I'm not sure I put it in my list, but it's this aspect of, uh, so you have a base model and you want to test it. And rather than jittering the starting parameters, the recommendation or consideration there um, was to inflate the fishing mortality rate uh, for an intermediate phase of the estimation and then, then let it go. So basically fixing fishing mortality rate at a, at a very high value and a very low value and ensuring that it returns to the, the maximum. So just maybe a note there to, to something, somebody to comment. Maybe I, I thought it was an interesting read because I either forgot or, or hadn't noticed that as a, as, a, as a thing. And that's something that's easy enough to implement, I think. Um, as far as data, data diagnostics, input sample sizes really matter. They should always matter. And, and I think that's a, a step in the right direction for considering downweighting composition data. And then obviously there's been a lot of discussion about data rich models that have no information, those types of things. And then a brief mention at the bottom here on distributional assumptions for index data in general. And just a, a shout out to Cole Monahan and working with Jim Thorson. I think they're getting uh, making some progress on implementing a generalized gamma for for distribution data that can vary, but basically the the shape and the variance obviously varies with, or the variance terms for index data can vary quite a bit between years, but in this case, they actually the generalized gamma has promised to allow the skewness to vary. And that's just a shout out to that. I think it's going to be a, a fruitful uh, endeavor down the road. As far as um, data, you know, the types of thing, this is one that uh, Craig Marsh in developing a sablefish model for, for us in the Alaska Center had this, uh, a very simple way of analyzing kind of are your data appropriately sampled according to the catch? And I think this is something that could easily be implemented in some of the IOTC problems that, that Dan Few was talking about yesterday where, you know, is the coverage adequate? And this is just a way of showing here the crosses represent the extent that catch was observed compared to how much was reported uh, by, by different gear types over time uh, for, for our fisheries. But this could quickly uh, highlight you know, are your data appropriately or sampled at least proportionately? Um, if not, maybe some other aspects should be taken into consideration. So that that's all I have on, on the data diagnostics. On the convergence, I've already talked about robustness a little bit and jittering. Uh, I will say one thing that, you know, MCMC can be daunting, um, but I think for initial model diagnostics, even a few handful of, of MCMC uh, runs from say stock synthesis can tell you a lot about where there might be problems with parameters. So I think that should be used uh, for two purposes. I, ideally, you can Im implement the full AD no U-turn sampler. It's, it's really great. I've had some fantastic luck with it in the last year. And I'm learning more about how to deal with the STAN diagnostics. Um, that's a crossover with the STAN software in general. Um, but anyway, it's it's really coming along. But even before that, an, another application of the ability to do MCMC and and say something like stock synthesis can really highlight which parameters might be causing problems. So I just wanted to to shout out there on convergence. I, like I said, I, I'm not a huge fan of of jittering because I think we should go straight for MCMC and jittering kind of falls away. That said, we still need to get the point estimate, so um, I won't be completely uh, negative about it. Moving on to, to goodness of fit, um, you know, there, there are a couple of new developments, I think, is you know, this one step ahead residual paper that's just come out by Vanessa Trizule and a, a cast of others. 
I th think that this is something that it doesn't have to be written in TNB. I think it can also be applied to others and, and something that should be examined. I think it helps with some problems with Pearson residuals. Uh, also this probability integration transform, which I also don't know much about, but uh, seems like a, a new way for uh, diagnostics and model fitting. Um, yesterday, uh, someone mentioned uh, the problem with comparing MCMC with point estimates. And um, as I said, I, I'm becoming a big fan of the 80 no u turn software package uh, for analyzing 80 model runs. And this was one of the side plots showing on the vertical scale uh, the asymptotic, basically variance, standard error in log space compared to the posterior distribution from the 80 nut straw. And so it's at least getting the variance terms right. And yeah, I think central tendency will differ simply because one's an integration and another's approximation. So why would it not um, be different? So it, by that, I mean, if there's any curvature at all between parameters in the likelihood, uh, the integrations will differ than uh, say a multivariate normal approximation. So anyway, that, that's just a comment there on, on treatments. Uh, another aspect that um, we've been looking at, you know, is, is using posterior predictive distributions. I guess there was some comment on that in, in yesterday's talk, but also um, I have a general problem with them. I finally have been able to develop them, but now I'm having difficulty. So in both of these cases, this is not a tuna assessment, but um, when we're done, here the yellow, yellow draws represent the mean, the expectation from a posterior distribution, and then the actual gray dots are, are the data expectations. And, you know, in terms of model diagnostics, where I'm a little bit stuck is like, well, what do you do in, in these cases? You know, it's, it's not a great fit in the most recent year, but most of the other years are really good fits. And so as a model diagnostic, I don't know what to do next. And so if there's any advice from any of you, I'd, I'd uh, really love to, to get some feedback. Um, I'll have some more on that in a couple of slides here. Um, I have a blank slide on uh, posterior distribution checks on retrospective patterns because that came up. Um, and it's something that would be interesting to do, but it would take a fair amount of uh, computation um, to there. But I think it is something that could be could be looked at with with some promise now, given the developments um, using AD nuts again. As far as retrospective patterns go, I have quite a few slides on that, um, just as a uh, mostly uh, to show some alternative presentation forms. Sorry if this is repetitive or redundant, but I will note in the survey from that Kappa meeting that retrospective analyses were pretty high across the board, um, just looking at the, the poll of post that meeting. So there's a lot of uh, interest in, in doing that. Um, so so it, this is a series of slides that are just gonna step through a retrospective where I put the full model in pink that stays in the background and on the left, uh, the spawning biomass, right, recruitment. And the point of doing this was to show that when I'll uh, highlight when we've got a strong year class that show up in the data right there. And then after more data are collected, it comes down to be the pink form and not very high. The point of that was to show that, well, we've got a really strong year class coming into the population in 2018. Is it going to stay that strong or is it going to do like this 2014 year class did and, and disappear? And, and so it's just another way of kind of having some eye candy available while things are talking. I thought it was a pretty interesting way to, to, to talk about these. And I have you know slides where I look at the spawning biomass and then the recruitment. I won't go too much into that. But um, uh, after I, I made this presentation, um, Cole Monahan gave a really nice way of uh, simply showing similar patterns. And uh, I, I'm going to adopt this in the future, but, but just briefly to explain, 
the um, the mean year class. This is a different stock, but um, similar idea. This is looking at cohort strengths with there's, when there's no data in the model, it goes to the mean. And then as each new year of data are added, it's it's how it moderates. Does it does it jump up and then come down? Uh, does it start low and then come high kind of thing? And so you can see the older cohorts obviously have more data and are pretty stabilized in, in their uncertainty and variability. Um, but yeah, it's it's a nice, concise way. I'm not gonna make you stare at this for too long, but but you can see um, you, get, you get the idea that it's a, it's a fairly nice way to look at. Um, another thing I like, which I think we, I haven't seen too often in tuna assessments, but uh, in retrospective patterns, if you're really digging into a single model and you want to know what's causing a cohort pattern or a, a retrospective pattern, um, it's useful, I think, to, to start to look at the data. And so here, a similar type of plot, um, looking at the cohort strength relative to the, the final value, um, but it's looking at it by data component. And so it's a similar plot relative to the mean. So when, when there's no new data, um, the, the Pearson residual for those, sorry, yeah, the Pearson residual relative to the, the final projected is, is changing. And the idea here is that these are different data inputs by the color. And it shows, for example, that there's a huge residual for the 2018 cohort for uh, this Shelikov survey. So that whatever color this is, um, shown by the cursor, um, is, is a nice way to break things out. Um, there's also, you know, looking at Moan's row type problems, you can evaluate the impact of data and evaluate the uncertainty. And this is an, another case study where just focusing on the left plot, you can see that the final black line here is, is an assessment. This is a historical case. And then historically, it jumped way up when you took away recent data. And so the question is, why is why do recent data affect the retrospective so much? And to address this question, we examined that index data separately to see how the cumulative log likelihood. So you're running the model. There's no data prior to 1990. You get the first observation and in the, in the, that bumps the negative log likelihood up. And then you get another observation every three years. And so you can see how it's changing the cumulative likelihood through time. And then here in 2012, there's a big jump up even in all the retrospectives and it's it's having an impact. Uh, it's affecting the, the overall likelihood. So it's just another way of maybe isolating if you're looking at a specific model, coming up with some diagnostics of how uh, in a retrospective sense, these should all be available at the end of each retrospective pattern. But I also added a way to just accumulate to see how much it changed historically um, on some of that. So, so that's um, that's that part. I wanted to end just on the likelihood. I don't have anything on hind casting. I think it's really awesome. We should do more of it. Um, but I don't have any good examples to show. And I just wanted to throw in a couple of uh, last slides on the plausibility and the likelihood profiles. And for those that haven't seen this before, um, this relates to the kind of Bayesian structural uncertainty of uh, Southern bluefin tuna. Um, and it's basically a way to look at the plausibility and just to highlight the diagonal here are identified key variables that we either uh, don't know at all. So we put in um, uninformative priors on. So equal, uh, it's determined by the prior, in this case, four different values of steepness. Um, and then in some cases, they're, they're likelihood weighted. And so M0 is the early natural mortality value. M10 is the is kind of an intermediate value. And then these are other parameters that were determined to be sensitive or not, might have had multiple terms. Uh, anyway, this, this cross would give you something on the order of 480 something grids, or maybe it's more five something in, in this case. And then you can uh, take 
these outputs. This is just a way to show the likelihood space or this parameter space that we're using for an operating model conditioning, which, I, uh, sorry, I just quickly converted to talking about operating models. But then we want to look at the uh, a likelihood profile, say, of an intermediate value. It's not a true profile likelihood in the sense, but you can look at uh, those alternative values that were fixed for M10 and evaluate the different components again. So this is kind of a, a, a profile to see what's the sensitivity of this intermediate natural mortality rate that were specified on different data types. And the colors uh, represent um, different values of steepness. So you can see if there's any interaction between steepness and how, in this case, this Indonesian data component and the, sorry, the dashed lines are kind of uh, two standard deviations or the confidence intervals uh, from a classical sense that you might say. So the units can be compared by the, by the dashed line. So if all the points are within the units, they don't have a, a big influence. If, if they're spanning the units, you can see for tag data, they have a big impact. Uh, on on the model fits and in, in when it relative to natural mortality. And glad to see Rich is in the audience and Anne can answer questions on this if they come up. Uh, another profile, going back to Pollock in the north, there's that 2010 year class again. And the question is, uh, you know, what data drive the estimate of this 2010 year class, sorry, 2018 year class, these are one year olds. Um, because they have such a huge impact on what the biomass is expected to be in the coming year. And so I'm going to combine those posterior pro probability distributions uh, and actually come up with negative log likelihoods or lack of fit scores uh, to this. And, and this does not have the um, problem of deviations because I'm basically in each model grid that I profiled over, I physically fixed the value of that 2018 year class and looked at the relative uh, fits. So it gets away from log R0 and stock recruitment and the, what did you call it? Full global deviation thing. Uh, I mean, I mean, might be mixing things a little bit, but but yeah. So anyway, it's a, it's a way of profiling across this, but it, sorry, this is not the MCMC part. This is actually a physical profile of the likelihood values shown here relative to the the actual value of that. So it's so something that was easy to implement, uh, just modifying the code slightly, and there's a switch to turn it off and on, and an and a argument to, to do a profile on, on this specific year class, because it's so important for going forward. I misspoke a little bit. I also created an alternative, which would be interesting to get feedback on because uh, it's un unclear to me how to deal with this. And so this is not a profile. This is uh, a presentation of from the posterior distribution of the likelihood components uh, with centered at zero as opposed to subtracting off uh, the minimum here because we're not talking about minimum. This is from, from the posterior distribution, uh, the values that you would see. And, and so you could see this data component was indicating it was favoring higher values of this 2018 year class, uh, whereas there's other components, the age distribution may be showing a slight decline. Uh, and just thought that was something kind of uh, a newer way to look at um, posterior or posterior distributions relative to management quantities and impacts that are important in a management setting. That's all I have for, for that. Uh, in taking notes from the, the, the other discussions, the type one error for kind of diagnostics and rejecting models. Uh, one question I have is kind of what are the fallbacks? Like if you really, model's not converging and, and that, you know, are you doing managers of service if there's no fallback kind of a thing? And then the issue of you know how no data models will will pass diagnostics and data rich often fail, and then uh, a favorite topic is for data rich how much information can we grade that 
you know, as far as telling us the things that are important for management. Uh, and then Felipe and I worked through a set of questions here on how to use diagnostics and that'll uh, stop. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, we kind of went over a little bit on time, but um, we'll start off the discussion period with, with questions for Jim, and then we can move on to questions for um, both Jim and, and Felipe, or just general comments on, on diagnostics. So does anyone want to start off with a question? No. So, so Jim, um, do you want to um, explain more about the um, method that you saw at the IATTC workshop that looked at different um, management advice scenarios to look for any differences in um, local minima? Yeah, I'd be interested on if you had some history on where that landed. I. I haven't seen any anyone use that, at least in recent time that I can remember. Yeah, I think it came out of the, the jittering issue, which, you know, there's the size of the jitter and things like that. And it was really hard to, to know what to do. But really what we were thinking about was, it's not important if you get the exact right answer, it's important that you get the right management advice. So the idea was if you start from different management advice, and you came to the same solution, then you're kind of more confident that the current result is close to what the management advice should be. And so we would, because you know, then you wouldn't have to jitter anything. You know, you just push it into some parameter space that might be, you know, a different result. And so you wanted to see to make sure that that wasn't the case. Yeah. We've we've never we haven't used it since I guess because we changed from a scalar to. Um, stock synthesis, so it was something we'd have to implement in stock synthesis um, through one of the, you know, a likelihood on F or something like that um, through a data yeah. point or something. In, in stock synthesis, you still have that ballpark F, I think, is in there, and maybe that could be manipulated in a, without too much code change. <laughs> okay. Any other? comments or questions for Jim's presentation? If not, then we'll move just on to general discussions about diagnostics. Um, does anyone want to start us off with anything? No. I personally am interested in the MCMC diagnostics. Every, everybody says use MCMC for diagnostics, but I haven't really had a clear presentation of, of what the benefits are and which diagnostics it provides that aren't in um, just a standard maximum likelihood approach. If I, if I could just respond to that, I mean, I, I guess there's two things, right? There's kind of management diagnostic sensitivity, and then obviously the diagnostics to test your convergence. and one of the advantages that are relatively, it's relatively new. I mean, some of the statistics have been around for quite a while, but um, is that the STAN package uh, gives you pretty clear guidance on, on convergence and uh, chains mixing. But, but how does that inform you about the model itself in terms of like a maximum likelihood? So if you don't, con if you don't get good convergence, then you shouldn't trust your MLE kind of estimates as well, um, does it, it shows, you can look at correlation between, between parameters easily, I guess, from the, from the joint posterior plots. Uh, what else is there that, it, that would give you something on, maybe an idea on, on how to fix your model or something like that? Oh, I guess if you're referring to the, yeah, do a, do a handful of them and, it, it, in stock synthesis, just to get an idea early on what parameters might be causing problems, I think I think that's been really useful as as a way to, especially with selectivity parameterizations, you can get things that are completely out of play that don't always come become apparent. And um, yeah, I, I think we should strive more to 
have models that allow you to do MCMCs to begin with. And that I think that's a, a new challenge. For yeah, Rich. Yeah, I think, well, Jim, you were talking a lot about the posterior predictive stuff, and that can be a really nice, I mean, once you've got your MCMC work and that stuff kind of falls out pretty quickly, it doesn't add a lot of additional computational burden. And if you can set it up so you can get the p-value approach to looking at that, you can boil down to a, a p, you know, a, a p-value whether your probability model is, is any good or not. It, that doesn't tell you how to fix it if it's not, but it does tell you that it's not working. I think one of the challenges, there's a lot of really complex machinery if you look at the k-fold cross-validation and things like that for MCMC stuff that you can do the kind of things that the hind casting or the you know the sort of cross validation stuff but it's it's computationally very very intensive so i think one of that's one of the advantages the mle has maybe in looking at some of that more complex um cross validation stuff far quicker but there are the tools available with the mcmc to do the same things i mean i guess one thing that it does is it shows you whether there's parameters on bounds, you know, if, if, if the bounds are causing a problem or if it's going off into extreme values, um, you know, uncertainty about a parameter. So, for example, if you had a selectivity curve and you had confounded parameters or parameters on bounds or, you know, the, the, when the parameters basically get really steep like that for a selectivity curve, what, what would you do to fix it? I mean, a lot of people in MCC just go and fix the parameter, which is kind of cheating. I mean... So is there a different way to do it that's actually a little more reasonable? Rich? Use the Stan algorithm. That generally fixes it. Like if you look at the old Metropolis Hastings and a lot of the, it doesn't matter whether it's Casala or stock synthesis, you would see people that show you a trace plot of the right-hand limb of a double normal selectivity that looked god awful. Uh, it hadn't remotely converged and they just said, but everything else looks fine, so it's okay. And that's the algorithm, not necessarily the, the model. It's just a bad MCMC algorithm. So I think Stan can help with a lot of that stuff, especially for those complex correlated parameters because it can take into account the geometry of the surface better. Yeah, Phil. Um, yeah, I've got, I guess I, I work, most of my assessments that I do are using AD Nuts or Stan and I found that um, usually the ones that have really poor you know, traces ultimately can be traced back to some kind of conflict in the model itself, so some kind of misspecification. And so usually, I guess, at least for a while, I moved away completely from doing MLEs because I just said, you know, if, if I just do that, I might end up with a set of models, none of which are actually internally consistent, but the MLE still gives me a reasonable looking estimate, you know, a priori. But once I run them through MCMC and try and essentially diagnose what's causing the problems in the MCMC, I often find that there's something in the model that isn't quite right. For example, that you know the, there's a peak in the catches that the model just can't take under the under the specification, and so you have to think about you know are those catches real? Are those you know is there something wrong in my model that means that it's not set up in a way to deal with the data that I've actually got? So. I think from that point of view, as Jim said, it doesn't give you the answer, but it gives you it gives you a hint that there's probably something wrong in your model and you should be digging a bit deeper and perhaps revisiting some of the structural assumptions that you've made. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other comments on MCMC diagnostics? No. I guess it would be one it'd be good if, if someone that uses a lot of these produced a paper that gives us some guidance on how to use them. Um, okay, any other questions on diagnostics on anything else? Yeah, Nicholas. Yeah, curious about the, the pass-fail dynamic and specifically with respect to retrospective analyses. I see in the Atlantic a lot the old bounds of Hurtado Ferro 2014, I think, are used. And thinking about your likelihood component plot, what, if, you, if you do see a big jump leaving off years of data, is that a reason to be maybe more liberal with your pass fail bounds for the Mons row? Or, or how do you go about um, thinking about that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think there's arguments to be made for when it's a data impact like that, that maybe you need better data, but it's usually not available. So, so dealing dealing with that and digging more into what is it about those data that caused such a big jump in in the trend um, that was inconsistent with the biology. And so I, I think it provides a little more comfort when it's based on data like that than it than oh say, oh, it's natural mortality. You know, those were noisy survey estimates. Um, you know, that or some other process, you know, they were just due to noisy survey estimates that um caused that and probably needed an additional variance added to to the to the surveys themselves that perhaps would have stabilized that pattern. I don't know if that answers your question, Nicola. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, I have a I have a follow-up on what Jim just said as well. Okay. And Nicola, um in terms of the of the uh, Felipe, Felipe Hurtado, yeah, you are absolutely right. We've seen the cutoffs from proposed by Felipe in many assessments. Uh, but one of the recommendations that came from the diagnostics workshop last year was actually to revisit um, those uh, uh, numbers, the, the limits proposed um, on his paper in 2015. But I also recommend um, to take a look at the Rose approach from Chris. Um, Chris Legon on the paper in 2020. That paper provides a very comprehensive way to examine possible causes for retrospective patterns and provide an integrated result based on models that address the retrospective patterns. So I think uh, we are, uh, uh, the paper from Felipe gave us a good idea of um, um, uh, plausible ranges, but as we understand more and more, I think we are potentially reaching to a point where we're going to have to revisit um, those proposed values. And Chris' paper, the Rose approach, is probably something that needs to be integrated into the diagnostic context when looking into um, retrospective patterns. Thanks, Felipe. Um, Arnie, you have a question. You got your hand up. Sorry, I missed you before. No, no problem. Yeah, thanks both to uh, Philippe and Jim for a great overview of, of the diagnostics, uh, something that we are going to focus on in this year's uh, Yellowfin and Big Eye assessments is to make sure we make it on Philippe's list of uh, who's doing what. <laughs> We've, of course, done some uh, diagnostics in the past, uh, mainly leading us in the model selection. And uh, some of those we've only presented sort of internally while we're uh, mo uh, developing the models. So I think we'll do, uh, yeah, emphasize more to to bring up all the diagnostics into the report. Uh, so we'll we'll probably get in touch with Philip and Jim to to make sure we uh, fulfill the uh, criteria of making it to the list. <laughs> Just a comment. Thanks, Ani. Uh, any other questions on diagnostics, Carolina? So. <laughs> We um, we are using for for big eye kind of like a, a a diagnostics on the trend of the residual pattern of the um, recruitment um, standard devia um, uh, recruitment deviations or estimates of recruitment and Gorka Merino um, also um, did a paper like highlighting this as a diagnostic and um we didn't discuss that very much uh here i was wondering if anybody will have uh thoughts on, on using that one and how we go about addressing it if we find a trend yeah so anyone want to make a comment on that no i i have a question or a comment um, so recruitment is often driven by the environment, and so we'd expect to have um, autocorrelation and patterns and regime shifts and all that in recruitment. So there might be diagnostics based on our assumptions about recruitment because we assume it's normally uh, log normally distributed typically. 
And so we end up getting patterns and residuals automatically because obviously our assumption about recruitment distribution is going to be violated just because we know it is. So is looking at patterns and residuals as a diagnostic something that we should be doing with the current models? Or should we be changing our models so that they represent what we think the recruitment patterns should be and then looking at diagnostics around that? So, so essentially, we should be using a um, you know autocorrelation in the the model, and then the residuals may be normally uh, log normally distributed around the the expectations. Carolina, do you want to respond? <laughs> yeah. So this, for example, the, the Alba core, not specific Alba core model, that we have some autocorrelation, right? At least for the MSC, I think there was some autocorrelation. And um, that, was, that was something that um, was thought up based on the, on the process that generates the, 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 the re re recruitment. Uh, but how I guess we could fix the 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 problem by thinking uh what processes might might be generated sort of like included in our conceptual model but um but at what point are we going to mask some some of the problem like what we are seeing in a regime shift in in uh in in the big a assessment or things so I will be a bit uh, wary of assuming something and masking some other problems. So I guess we will have to have both, both scenarios and discuss it, right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other comments on that? OK, if not, let's see if there's any other questions or topics that people want to bring up about diagnostics. Yeah, Carolina. Yeah, I also think um, doing, doing sim simpler models, uh, depending on your model structure, it will be different. Like for example, each structural production model for a, a one area model or uh, one area models for a spatial a spatial models, etc. That is very useful diagnostic. Uh, we did uh, depletion uh, models for yellowfin tuna, and and the just the depletion uh, estimates uh, within a year were were very similar. Uh, the the estimate of the uh, biomass at the beginning of the year, estimated by this depletion model, were very similar to the uh, integrated model. So. That gave us confidence that the integrated model has some information to estimate um, the scale. So I guess uh, in general, like thinking about some simpler models uh, that, uh, that will make sense, of course, uh, it will be a good avenue for using as, as a diagnostic as well to learn about your models and uh, more than anything, right? to learn where the information is coming from and um, how strong your model is. Thanks, Carolina. Okay. Um, so Felipe, um, your group has been doing a simulation experiment in terms of trying to determine, basically calibrate diagnostics. Um, can you give us a short, idea of um, where you're at with that and, and what you tend to do in the future? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Um, we So um, Nicola, uh, who is present um, at the meeting, is also leading that initiative with Maya Kapoor from the Alaska Fisher Science Center and myself and Magoshima. So pretty much we are Moving forward, we're going to have a paper submitted to the Good Practices Special Issue. And the paper focus on pretty much standing um, our cookbook research. We are exploring the 
the uh, efficacy of the model diagnostics um, to detect model specific model misspecifications. And I think of the big um, addition from these papers that we really we try to develop a pretty comprehensive simulation approach um, using um, different model assumptions um, with um, models that are recruitment driven, models that are not recruitment driven. And so on. we're really trying to pretty much what with the cookbook and other papers that we published, we were using uh, specific examples, stock, existing stock assessments pretty much. Now we, we kind of took to the, um, to the next um, level and try to test those diagnostics um, under a more um, robust simulation approach. And where we are now is we, and the conclusion so far is, is just really difficult to find when the cutoffs um, are working for certain diagnostics. And in our presentation during the um, workshop in, in, in Rome, is some of those, um, the P values from the runs test, even the, the values, the, the cutoff values from Felipe on the, on the retrospective. Right? They are, it is just very difficult to identify when they actually work given to specific modeling specifications. Um, but yeah, we are, we are, we are planning to, to publish that paper and hopefully we'll, you know, just take that discussion to, um, a step, um, forward, but, um, we are, we're, we're working on it. Okay, thanks, Felipe. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions? Okay, um, we've got 10 minutes left of discussions. One, one thing I'd like to bring up is the hindcasting. So hindcasting is um, something that's being promoted and is quite popular at the moment. Um, but like everything in stock assessment, um, we're not actually observing the management objective. So hindcasting is, is um, typically the way it's been done is like one step ahead prediction of uh, CPUE. That's kind of the, the gold standard in the hindcasting. Um, but the CPUE is typically not our management objective. So the question is, how well does hindcasting work in terms of a diagnostic if it's not predicting the management objective and is it and is it the possibility of bias of selecting simple models that smooth things over maybe models that are better at um, achieving the management objective toshi do you have a comment since you're one of the main no. <laughs> promoters of this yes uh thank you so as a as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, so CPU is sometimes noisy. So if we rely on the uh, outcomes of the hind casting through the CPU only, uh, we may misleading the, our argument regarding the uh, prediction scale. So that's one point. And so I think the Felipe's paper, uh, uh, also the uh, Henning's uh, activity, include the other sources of the information for the uh, mean length. And so that might be uh, independent information of in, or in, apart from the uh, CPU, even, that's one point. And uh, I want to address uh, another issue. We are using a biomass estimate and also recruitment as shown in Jim's presentation for the retrospective analysis or evaluating the prediction scale. But we may be able to show such kind of figures for other resources, uh, other quantities like a more management context, uh, like a B ratio, F ratio, for example, that, that is relevant to the stock condition, but B ratio and F ratio may be uh, canceled out for the mis uh, retrospective pattern. So maybe we may not see any patterns for the F ratio and B ratio, but when it comes to the uh, management context, MSY might be, uh, our BMSY might be also a good candidate to see the uh, if there are any retrospective patterns or not, that might be uh, more relevant to the uh, consistent management advice through the uh, stock assessment. So that's that's what I want to say one one point. Another point is the hindcasting or uh, prediction scale can evaluate the 
models with a different model, uh, model different data, like uh, SS3, we use the CPU and the language composition, et cetera, et cetera. But we, uh, we can also compare the like a production model, for example, which can only use the CPU for fitting. And uh, retrospect uh, hand casting can work. Uh, AIC doesn't work because the data is different. But uh, like a hand casting or other prediction scale evaluation framework can compare the different model with a different data set. And for example, when we see the production model has a great performance in terms of the prediction scale or any inconsistency in terms of retrospective pattern, that may be very much useful. And if we see the very big retrospective pattern in a SS3 example, for example, we uh, very much hesitate to say. So in terms of the consistent stock assessment, production model might be good. But using only the production model is not assessment because we don't know what happened actually in dynamics. So the outcomes of the production model may be used for the other channel for the fixing the uh, SS3 uh, biomass level or something like that. That kind of the mixture of the different model, different way of the ensemble might be the uh, further way to consider. That may violate the concept of the statistical estimation, but uh, practical, there might be some practical sense. That, that's my comment. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Toshi. Any comments on hind casting? Jim, yeah. Yeah, just, just to follow up on that, just looking through some of those cases where the hind casting seemed to perform well in both cases, or, you know, in a production model or, or a, a more aid structured full assessment, I was struck by the, the data type, like the CPUE indices that were being used weren't very variable. And so I, I just wonder if hind casting might be an, an, a deceiving tool, I should say, because well, just to be a little controversial, it could, could be deceiving if you're fitting to an index that doesn't change very much from year to year. It, it gets really, it performs really well because it's easy to predict like, oh, the average kind of thing with a slight, slight modest movement. And I guess for production models, I, I haven't, done it yet, but I'm kind of a Henning fan when he says you should really simulation test where you know the answer and then simplify with the production model and see if you're getting getting that rather than use a hindcast to say, oh, production model works better that way. I don't know, just that that seems to be the way to go, or at least that would be my tendency for judging between an integrated age structured model and a production model. For, for application purposes. Thanks, Jim. Um, if there's no other comments, I want to take something that Toshi said and put it back to Felipe. So Toshi said that it might be better to evaluate your performance somehow related to the management quantities. And I was wondering, Felipe, in your simulation analysis, when you're looking at um, the uh, um, diagnostics and, and, and uh, model and specification, everything. What is the measure that you are using to determine whether the diagnostics should indicate a model has a problem? Is it a sort of percentage change in a management quantity? Like if, if you have a misspecified model and it estimates of F divided by FMSY, which is biased by say 10%, then that would trigger the value of the diagnostic that would be used to determine the model was misspecified enough that you need to worry about it? Or what, what is the objective? Yeah, um, thanks Mark, that's a great question. So we're, for this paper, we're focused on management quantities. We haven't decided yet in the specific of cutoffs for changes but we are looking into changes in management quantities specifically to address conversations that we had last year during the, the diagnostics workshop to start looking to diagnostics performance in relation to management quantities. So that's, so we're, that, that's what the link that we're doing, diagnostics performance and, and impact on management quantities. So that's what we're going to focus on the paper. Okay. Thanks Felipe. Okay, we're getting to the end, so I think I'll close off this topic and um, 
Thanks, everyone. And we're going to move on to the final topic of the workshop. Um, and so we're going to be talking about model weighting. Um, and this is a specific session that um, ISSF is, is um, interested in and is part of the reason for the funding for the workshop and some of the participants to attend. And so our first uh, presenter is Max. Um, can you hear us and can you share your screen? Okay, I don't see Max online. Do we have a what's the time? Okay, just bear with us a few seconds here and let's us work this out. There's the coffee. I was going to break for coffee, but we haven't. <laughs> the food's not there yet, so. So, um, okay, let's let's just break for um, half an hour for coffee. Hopefully, the the food will come out during that period, and we'll see what's happening here. Um,